Good morning. Woo. Uh, Cindy is not here, at least not yet. Remember, she's got that, is it hip replacement tomorrow? So uh, we'll be watchful for her. Uh, let's see, I don't see Melissa. S Susan, I guess, still getting better. I thought we could try to get them together for a little, uh, you know, a little uh, take them out jogging or something sometime soon. Uh, I think that would be good for both of them. Uh, welcome to class. Um, these little uh, notes I've got, they're just to myself, and I'm going to be mainly in the book. There were some things last week that um, I'm going to just quickly hit on, re review, um, and then we will get into Acts. We're in the book of Acts, of course. We're going to get in Acts 22. This has just been one of the more uh, uh, interesting, of course, the Bible is always interesting. I don't mean that silly. Um, because I think throughout my life, usually when you study Acts for a quarter, you get to about <clears throat> chapter 20, and then you're done with the quarter, and you quit. And the teacher says, well, I hope that in, in your spare time in the near future, you'll read the remainder of the book of Acts. But we're actually going to finish it sometime uh, here soon. So this is... Every once in a while, I come across something. It just seems like it's really new. That man, I just have haven't seen that before. Uh, I've probably forgotten it or something. But this is just really neat. It's it's so historical, of course. But then, when you try to relate yourself to Paul's life and the things that he's dealing with, of course, he reviews it. Remember, Second Corinthians chapter eleven. I did this, 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 this. I was whooped on. I was shipwrecked eat much, you know, I didn't drink much, you know, all those terrible things. Um, and he did that, um, you know, was it yesterday that was Veterans Day and you have all these thoughts of, of men and women who have like given the ultimate sacrifice uh, for us, for our country. And uh, then I started thinking uh, as I was reviewing this yesterday evening, that's kind of what Paul did. And he uh, would gladly have given his life um, for Christ, and, and everything was about uh, teaching, 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 and sacrificing. I'll, I'll, I'll go here, I'll go here, here, here. He just had this wonderful life. So um, let's see. Let me go back to my first little yellow thing here. And um, is everybody okay with how we discussed Paul's uh, rather unusual, the, the author calls it perplexing, Remember last week, um, Paul has been on this journey with the, with the goal of getting to Jerusalem. He wanted to get back to Jerusalem and try to get, you know, wanted to get there before Pentecost for whatever his m multiple reasons could have been. He gets there and he goes and sees uh, the elders, the elders of the church, the leaders, the Jewish community at that time. And uh, it's, you know, it's probably been 20 years or so. Uh, since he's been there, so things have changed, and he goes. He sees James, uh, Jesus's brother, and he meets with them, and they says, "Man, it's so great to see you, Paul. We've kind of heard about the neat thing." And Paul relates in just vivid detail all these things. You may you can't believe what happened to me in Ephesus, how successful I was in Philippi, and there's with this jailer guy, and it was just so neat. The Lord actually bumped me in the night and opened the jail up. And all of these stories, and then the, the uh, leaders, the elders say, Paul, it's so great. All these things have been happening. We want to kind of warn you a little bit here because this is Jew country, and a lot of these people here have heard that you're shifting away from the old law, and surely that's not true. And you need to do some things uh, to reconnect with your Jewish heritage and make sure everybody knows that you really follow the law. And nothing is said in that chapter about Paul's verbal response. And I, I find that unusual, but he went ahead and he did those things. Remember, he took the four fellows that were under a vow and he paid for their haircut. And, you know, that was part of the Nazarite vow. And then he went through a purifying sin offering 
under the old law. And we had an interesting discussion. Is everybody okay with our discussion? It, you know, there, there, remember I said there's really no right or wrong. He could well have stood up and said, this is wrong, I'm not going to do it. We're not under the old law, we're under Jesus' law. And he didn't, evidently. And he went ahead and did that. And the, the application to my life is, is Paul's statement later on that I've occasionally got to be all things to all people. I've got to the Jews, I became as a Jew, et cetera, et cetera. And we talked about the transition that the religious world at that time was in, the Jewish law, going from the old to the new law. And Paul allowed that as part of that transition. So sometimes uh, maybe I'm in a discussion with somebody and I want to be patient. And I want to understand the transition. I want to understand the urgency of salvation, but I also want to be clear that people mature uh, at different rates. Sometimes it's easier to talk to somebody who has an absolutely clean slate uh, spiritually than it is somebody who may be 30 or 40 years old and raised in this religious setting or this religious setting. Uh, see what I'm getting at? there. I just want to make sure that we were all okay with our discussion last week and um, evidently everybody is okay. Is that okay? All right. I, I think there were some good lessons that I learned uh, that Paul gave me uh, an example of. And um, one of the things I think um, maybe Nicole brought it up that he's looking out to this group of people realizing he was like that and it even he kind of thought back to where he was when Stephen was stoned. He was right there. Um, and we're going to hear that he says some of those things uh, in chapter 22. Um, and the Nazarite vow that these guys were under, everybody, who's some famous people that uh, may have lived an entire life with the Nazarite vow? Samson. Samson. John the Baptist were mentioned by him, and it could be others that we may have seen. Uh, the author mentions it as a vow of separation and dedication. You know, not necessarily isolation, but you, you, you know, you, you focus uh, on your vow. Maybe it's uh, a brief period of time. Maybe it's uh, for your whole life that you abstain from certain things uh, and you focus your life uh, toward God. You know, people... Uh, take vows like that sometimes today. I'm, it'd be an interesting conversation, we'll say, at, uh, as to what they're doing. You know, uh, you give up something for a period of time. Some religious people uh, do that about this time of year, really. Um, did anybody look up the Egyptian fellow that uh, the, anybody do that? Um, remember as uh, Paul was being introduced to the uh, Roman soldier that was kind of in charge of uh, protecting him, he said um, when Paul talked to him in Greek, uh, he said, I'm kind of surprised, I thought you were that Egyptian guy, he had total misconception uh, of who Paul was. Uh, and there was a, a, an Egyptian fellow in history who claimed to be the Messiah and led an army to the top of the Mount of Olives uh, um, the Roman governor Felix attacked him. The Egyptian himself had escaped. So this soldier thought, well, maybe that's who it is. Turned out it wasn't. It's just kind of a little blurb there. I didn't know if, if anybody had looked it up. I just did for a little bit. And um, okay, I, I've got one other thing I'm going to look at here in a little bit, but I want us to get into um, chapter 22. I want to look back. The, the red book is in ESV. My Bible's in New King James, so I, I try to keep this uh, try to keep this available because I think most of you are looking at. Uh... All right, let's start in Acts chapter twenty-two. Um, 
Paul has already been confronted by the uh, leaders at Jerusalem. He went to the temple. He got really uh, physically uh, accosted, uh, you'll say, there. And that's when this, uh, the Roman guys came. The last thing they want is uh, uh, controversy and riot and um, out of control mobs. So that's what he's trying to avoid. Uh, and at the end of chapter 21, he says, sir, do you, can I please, I, I, can I just talk to these people? He says, okay, uh, we're here now. We got swords. They don't, at least not the ones we're seeing. So you go right ahead. And he, and he um, now is talking to the people um, under the oversight of the Romans, but he, he talks to them. He says, brethren and fathers, well, the very first thing he does is he addresses them, brethren and fathers. He tries to get a relationship, and he tries to show uh, some respect. Hear my defense, which I now offer to you. And when they heard that he was addressing them in the Hebrew dialect, probably uh, Aramaic, which is a common language of the day, they quieted down. <laughs> That's fantastic, really. I'm a Jew, like you. I was born in Tarsus, but I was brought up in this city. I was brought up right here in Jerusalem, and I was educated, um, spiritual education, under Gamaliel, one of the most famous, if not the, mo the most famous uh, Jewish rabbi. Educated under Gamaliel strictly according to the law of our fathers. I was zealous for God just as you all are today. There was a time in my life I was just like you. I persecuted this way, Christians, Jesus followers, to the death, binding, putting both men and women into prison. The high priest and the whole council of the elders uh, at least back then, could testify. If any of them are still alive, it would be interesting if any of them were still uh, around. This may be 20 or so years later. From them, I received letters to the brethren. Started off for Damascus in order to bring even those who were... I heard that, that some of these uh, Christian people had gone to Damascus and were messing up their minds, and I wasn't going to allow that to happen. Uh, if I'm, if I'm going to kick on them here, I'm sure going to go follow them and kick on them there. And I'm going to bring them back to Jerusalem as prisoners to be punished. I'm going to treat them like some kind of lawbreaker because they followed my say. Your part, but um, there's a word, and this is my last little yellow thing. When Paul said, "I'm going to give a defense," the word that's used there, the Greek word that's translated defense, is apologia. Well. What word do we? What words do we get from that? Apologetics. What else? Apology. We think of apology as uh, you know, saying you're sorry to someone. <clears throat> this is apologetics. Apology, which is the A P O, is uh, the word from. I sort of say from the word from, that sounds kind of goofy. Um, APO, from, and then L-O-G-O, logos, logics, uh, reason, or words. So what I want to do when I'm giving an, <coughs> an apology, a defense, is I want to use my words and I want to use my reason uh, to uh, make my point, to uh, to state my position, and that's what he's doing here. He's giving uh, a defense, and of course, that is going to remind you of Peter's statement to be ready always to give a defense or to give a reason of the hope that lies within you. Make sure you got the right attitude. What's it say after that? With what? Meekness and fear. Be ready always to give an answer to everyone who asks you a reason of the hope that lies within you with meekness and fear. Don't be jerky about it. Uh, let's see.
so he ties himself to them and provides almost a brotherhood to them. Um, it's a good example of how you communicate with somebody. If you, can, if you can create a relationship with somebody, then you can have a good conversation. I've said that a thousand times. Uh, some things that you can say in conversation number five, you can't say in conversation number one, uh, right? You might hurt somebody's feelings, you might run them off, and you might make them think you're nuts. Uh, but after three or four conversations, then you might be able to say, hey, there's some things about your life I, want, I just want to ask you about because I notice it and because I care about you. And you're going to receive that better after five conversations than you will after one. Right? Uh, we're just humans, aren't we? Uh, I was brought up strictly according to the law. In other words, uh, this thing that, that you're thinking about me uh, as being against the law, just be patient with me a little bit and I'll explain myself. Um, he didn't say it right here, but yeah, I, I don't demand circumcision anymore. You don't have to keep the Sabbath anymore. And on and on it goes. There's some things that have changed, but remember we, we looked at, uh, I think it's in Hebrews, where he said these things are becoming obsolete or, or moving toward uh, passing away. Remember uh, Hebrews 7, 8, 9, 10, uh, right in there. Everybody okay so far? Yeah. Yeah. says, for the honor in which Gamaliel was held by his contemporaries is demonstrated by the fact that a certain year was only provisionally known as leap year until he gave his approval. <laughs> as a pupil of so distinguished an educator, Paul hoped to find favor with his hearers. Wow. Isn't that, isn't that right? Yes. All he had to do was say the word and it happened. Yeah. And we shall observe. <laughs> Wow. And um, the way that it was explained either here or somewhere else was if you studied at the feet of Gamaliel, you were literally at his feet. He might be sitting in a chair on a bench. Uh, and there's that position of respect, uh, almost to the point of reverence there. Uh, uh, kind of like talk to him. Um, <laughs> exactly. You read the red book, didn't you? Good for you. Uh, yeah, it, it basically said, oh, you're reading it right now? <laughs> you are too honest. You could have gotten by with one right there. Uh, <laughs> no, he, he said, you're exactly right. They, they, remember the commander said, I'm afraid they're going to tear you apart. They were physically... They weren't just mad at him. Uh, they were physically uh, uh, tearing at him. Um, where was that? I don't know if it's... Maybe, right? I'm going to... Let me take 20 seconds. Uh, oh, shoot. There was some... Oh, here it is. Here it is. Um, it's on page 326. There's an apocryphal writing. It's not... Um, it's not uh, inspired uh, Bible stuff. It's called Acts of Paul and uh, Thecla, whoever that is. It's, <laughs> this is terrible. Um, Paul was bald-headed, bow-legged, strongly built, a man small in size, meeting eyebrows, and a rather large nose. Now, who would write that about somebody? Man, I, uh, well, I just have to be truthful. Well, um, anyway... Uh, he wasn't, it's not like they're beating up Tom Selleck, okay? Uh, or who's, who's nowadays hunks, young people? See, I'm thinking Tom Selleck because that's when, when I was young. Uh, my mother liked Hugh O'Brien. Does anybody remember? He was, I guess he was a hunk when she, huh? Was he Wyatt Earp? Okay. Uh, 
Yeah, she would always go, ooh, ooh. <laughs> she, and my dad. <laughs> uh, so this poor Paul, it's not like they were beating up somebody that was, you know, tall, dark, and handsome. Uh, and what made it worse was he was beaten up. And he's standing there, and he asks them to uh, give their attention to him. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, I lost my place. Oh, shoot. <laughs> Sorry about that. Too many of these yellow things. Okay, all right. Um, and he told them about the uh, uh, letters to the brethren, going to Damascus. All right, that is, now let's go to... Um, verse 6. And then he continued, and I'm, I'm going to go ahead and read this. I know we read it before back in chapter 9, but uh, it happened that as I was on my way approaching Damascus about noon, a very bright light suddenly flashed from heaven all around me, and I fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus the Nazarene, Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. Interesting that in Jesus, and I just now thought of this, in Jesus' words, although he was persecuting Christians, who does Jesus say he was persecuting? You're persecuting me. When you're persecuting, uh, when you've done it unto the least of these, my brethren, uh, you do it unto me. And those who were with me saw the light, to be sure, but did not understand the voice of the one who was speaking to me. And I said, uh, what shall I do, Lord? Uh, I did think of this earlier. What a profound question for Paul to repeat right there because what shall I do, Lord, was for the rest of his life. It wasn't just stand up, go into Damascus, and you'll get your sight back. What shall I do, Lord, uh, involved the remainder of his life. And the Lord said to me, get up, go on into Damascus, and there you'll be told of all that has been appointed for you to do. Since I couldn't see because the brightness of that light blinded me, I was led by the hand by those who were with me, and I came into Damascus, and a certain Ananias. Now, remember, uh, and I went back and read in, in chapter 9, when he was led to Damascus, he didn't see Ananias for three days, remember? So what I was going to do, I was hoping Brian would be here. Uh, I was going to ask uh, these questions, but you can apply it to somebody else sometime, um, Cindy's son. Um, all right, Paul is this extremely religious person. He knew his scriptures uh, because of his teacher and the scrolls. He, he knew what was in the Bible that he had of that day, knew all the prophecies. Somewhere in this situation, would you agree that he went from lost to saved? Okay? All right. And this is a good question. This is a really good, I've used this for you. This is a really good uh, um, thought process for um, someone who hadn't been around um, churchianity, I sometimes call it, uh, much in their life. So, all right, would you say that in this situation, after reading the whole thing, that he went from lost to saved? Yes, okay. So he's, he's killing Christians, he's imprisoning them, he's fighting against everything related to Jesus. He's lost. Yes. All right, he's on the road to Damascus to kill some more, imprison some more, bring them back, do whatever. Uh, and he sees, uh, the, the light blinds him, and he talks to Jesus. Now maybe things are starting to make sense. Did he get saved right then? Oh, no. So he's led into Damascus, and he's there three days rethinking all this. His life, his scriptural upbringing, certain passages that he would have remembered. Uh, maybe, he, maybe he could remember Isaiah chapter 53. I mean... Uh, he was led as a sheep to the slaughter. Maybe he's like the Ethiopian. And maybe he remembered that that's the Messiah. 
At that point, his heart would have been changed. And he got saved, right? Okay. Hmm. What, I mean, once he came to an awareness of his uh, spiritual uh, condition and accepted Jesus as his Savior, wouldn't that have saved his soul? Well, let's, wouldn't that have... have and, and a good thing to say right here is, wouldn't that have cleared up his sin problem? Okay, we keep going, and uh, he meets Ananias. Ananias talks to him, and Ananias evidently didn't go through some lengthy... Uh, let's just keep reading. Uh, verse 12, a certain Ananias, a man who was devout, those of you who are listening, he was just as devout as you uh, by the standard of the law, well spoken of by the Jews who lived there. So he probably would have been well spoken by you all who are hearing me. He came to me, standing near to me. He called me brother, a Jewish brother, Saul, receive your sight. At that very time, I, I received my sight and I was saved. Well, let's, let's see. And he said, the God of our fathers has appointed you to know his will. You know his will now. You've seen the righteous one. You've seen your Savior. You've seen the Messiah. You've seen Jesus Christ. And you heard something from his mouth. You heard Jesus talk to you. Now you're going to be a witness for him to all men of what you've seen and heard. Now, why do you wait? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins calling on his name. Now, was he saved? You bet. He was baptized and washed away his sins. Isn't that right? Isn't that what you get from this? And you can bring up other things that Paul wrote about. Don't you not? When you're baptized into Christ, you're baptized into his death, and you rise to walk in newness of life. Uh, when you're baptized into Christ, you put on Christ. He said that somewhere. Uh, why do you get up and be baptized and wash sins away? Can each of us, uh, wasn't it, was it Jeremy Wednesday night that said sometimes we have trouble, or, I can't remember, uh, we have trouble uh, even telling somebody um, how to, telling somebody the story of the gospel and telling them the salvation of their soul. That, that story right there is a really, 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 really good uh, starting point because it, comp it compresses everything. I was bad, then I got good, and then I got saved because I was baptized into Christ. His blood washed my sins away, and uh, now I'm going to be a witness for him to all men of what you've seen and heard. Isn't, that sh should be pretty easy for all of us, I think, right? I think it works. I think it works. All right, um, yeah, I had a little exclamation point by what shall I do, Lord, with the rest of my life. Think how Paul's life changed. And did Paul's life get just a whole stinking lot better when he became a Christian? <laughs> Jesus even said, wasn't it to Ananias, I'm going to tell him how much he's going to have to suffer for me. And, uh, and he did. Now, let's see. Verse, um, is there uh, any comments? Uh, uh, yeah, Stephen. I think you said it right. I think some people sometimes use the brother of Saul, you know, as, as uh, oh, he was already a Christian, you know, but, but he, you know, he was a fellow Jew. You know? Yeah, I think that's right. Yes, yes, sir. I think so. Yeah, I think brother did not mean um, member of Christ's body right there. Yes, sir. Right. And not recognize the Messiah. Right. And Ananias is relating, uh, is related to Paul that God had chosen him. Yeah, a Ananias was, a, was Jewish. He was a Jew. So was Jesus. Don't forget that. Ananias was a Jew, but he was a Christian. He had become a Christian. 
Otherwise, he wouldn't have known the process. And uh, you can go twice, Stephen. We, oh, well, that's OK. You can have unlimited. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, there's two or three times capitalized W, uh, the way. Um, and I think we may see it a, a time or two. And it's not until later that it, you know, Jesus has said, you know, when he was living, I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He called it his church, his body, his assembly uh, when he was living. And that's when he said, hey, who do you guys say that I am, you know? Yes. Yeah. Very good. Yeah, that is kind of interesting. Jesus says, I'm the way, and they called it the way. I never thought of that before. Thank you. Uh, very good. Anything else? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and he knew he wasn't saved in that situation because he wasn't too happy then. And then you have to wait, you know, one to three days. You don't hear anybody today, including Frank McGram or anybody else, tell them, three days later, come back and I'll tell you what to do. Right. That's what happened here. And I asked three days later, told Saul, so when he said, Arise and be baptized and wash away your sin, that's what you're not going to hear that today either for those who have to date, you know, this sort of thing. I, I get an email every day just to read the scripture, but it's email.com, uh, I believe. But they sincerely believe that all you got to do is believe, and you'll be saved. You know, and uh, I've written them twice, by the way, and didn't get a response either time. But uh, <laughs> I expected that. But at any rate, we are bombarded by people today who do not know the scriptures, and still they think they can tell us. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it it is. Uh, I can I can probably relate to maybe two situations where someone said, you know, I've been told this all my life, but I've never seen this before. In other words, I didn't read my Bible. So, yeah, Terry. Good. Yeah, yeah I, 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 most of us probably don't get three hours. Sometimes, I, bless your hearts if you've got young children. Do you, Josh, you ever get three minutes of peace and quiet in your house? Um, <laughs> Eric and Audrey, they got four now, and it, it's like walking into a cage full, you know, it's, uh, uh, they're just, I mean, to me, it's, it's refreshing and it's invigorating because they're just so energetic. Um, but I know, I, you know, we had two children and, you know, they were four years apart. Years are just kind of scrunched uh, into one age. Um, so, you know, if you've got a lot of children, if you've got, you know, a big family, you can, you can hardly find 
uh, time for peace. Maybe you get up early or you stay up late. And it is so important, I believe, to find just a few minutes of solitude. Even if it's five minutes. Just maybe, uh, like I like to just go out on the deck uh, during certain times of the year when it's cooler. And just seeing stars is a big thing to me. Uh, just find a few minutes. Uh, and Paul was given, I think, you're, I think he was given three days to contemplate what has my life been and now I've, I've talked to Jesus. Now what? And three days, that's, that's a stinking long time uh, to just, as you say, just think about things. And, um, Yeah, yeah, Kenny? I think he singled him out because he was almost a perfect Jew, even to the letter of the law. He knew this would be a letter of the law to the Christians, so yeah. that's his opinion. Yeah, well, <coughs> it's an observation. You, you know, you observed a life of zealousness. He, he, I, I was zealous. I mean, you're a zealous brother. I was too. I am just like you were. And... Uh, it's, it's neat to, to find a few minutes and, th and just think about it. Um, verse 17, it happened when I returned to Jerusalem, I was praying in the temple, that I fell into a trance. Now what's interesting is he's relating some new information. We haven't seen this before. And he's uh, relating this to the, these Jewish uh, people. And I saw him saying, Make haste, get out of Jerusalem quickly, because they're not going to accept your testimony about me. And I said, Lord, they themselves understand that in one synagogue after another, I used to imprison and beat those who believed in you. It's like he's reminding Jesus, maybe you've forgotten something, Lord. Uh, and when the blood of your witness, Stephen, was being shed, I was standing by, approving, watching out for the coats of those who were slaying him. And Jesus said to me, go, I'll send you far away to the Gentiles. Uh-oh. <laughs> um, tough word right there. Um, they listened to him up to this statement or this word. Uh, what did he say? Gentiles. The Jewish people of that day there in Jerusalem were very happy if a Gentile became what? A Christian? No. They were very happy if a Gentile became a Jew. Remember we said in the synagogues there were uh, three or four different kinds of people. There were the Jewish people. Then there were Gentiles who had been proselyte. They had proselytized and become Jewish. Went through all the ceremony and everything. Uh, then there were what were called God-fearing uh, Gentiles. Uh, they believed in the Jewish uh, doctrine, if you want to use that term. Um, and that was about it. Uh, anything, <coughs> excuse me, anything outside of that, no way. They, away with such a fellow from the earth. He shouldn't, let, we're going to start all over on the killing process. He should not be allowed to live. These religious people were willing to kill him when he had had this very mature conversation with them, and as they were crying out, throwing off their clothing, tossing dust in the air, I didn't read anything particular about the throwing dust in the air other than that just an indication they were absolutely enraged. Maybe kick the dust off your feet. I don't know. Maybe you found something I didn't. And they were crying out, throwing off their clothes, tossing dust in the air. The commander said, bring him into the barracks, stating that he should be now... I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll figure, we'll figure the truth out of him. We'll just beat the living daylights out of him. We'll scourge him. Uh, and we'll find out the reason why they were shouting against him uh, that way. They stretched him out. What did Paul say? Wait a minute. Uh, and I'm hurrying now. Sorry. I'm a, I am uh, a Roman citizen. Is it lawful for you to scourge a man? who Probably wasn't even lawful for them to bind him. And... 
<laughs> I'm sure the, uh, the Roman officials there said, uh, uh-oh. <laughs> so the, um, the commander says, let's see, when the centurion, heard, remember the tribune or the commander, oversaw centurions who, uh, who oversaw maybe 100 people. So the centurion this. He goes to the tribune, the commander. Hey, uh, what are you about to do? This man is Roman. Uh, the commander says, are you? And he said, yes, I am. And the commander says, well, I bought my citizenship. Said I, and Paul said, I was actually born. I said, his parents, or one of them, uh, was a Roman citizen. Therefore, <clears throat> those who are about to examine him immediately let go of him. He became hot potato. I am away from here. Uh, I got to get some milk and cookies. Uh, the commander also was afraid when he found out that he was a Roman because he had put him. There's that I knew that because he had put him in chains. You weren't even supposed to change. There were certain advantages in our country. There's advantages to being a United States citizen. I know that's diminishing, I get it, um, but still, it's wonderful to be a United States citizen. I have a, uh, a lady who's a client, she was uh, born in Panama, came to the United States, and she carries that statement of her citizenship, all the things she had to go through and the tests and all that, she waves that proudly. And Paul used it here. Um, Let's see, uh, on the next day, wishing to know for certain why he had been accused by the Jews, he released him, ordered the chief priests and all the council to assemble and brought Paul down and set him before them. So what the commander decides is the best way to, he, he, he really just want to know what's going on. I, I don't think he's got Paul figured out quite yet. Are you the Egyptian guy? Uh, why are they tearing you to pieces? Uh, I heard you talk about how... You were a Jew just like they were, and the moment you said non-Jew, they're, they're ready to kill you, and I have to protect you again. Um, let's, I tell you what, this is all about your religion. I don't know about your religion. I don't care about your religion. All it is is I don't want anybody to come down from Rome and jump all over me because I can't keep the peace. And we're going to figure this out tomorrow, and we're going to get these, this religious group, the chief priests and all the council, to assemble brought Paul and set him before them. Uh, ta -ta -ta -ta. Already did that part. Rights of a citizen. It's interesting that I guess all you have to say is, uh, yeah, I'm Roman. I don't know if he had a document with him. Well, I didn't. I guess there are documents. I don't, I don't know how he could have had one in his wallet or anything right then. It's probably worse to uh, claim to be a Roman citizen and later be found out that you aren't, you'll probably just <clears throat> take your head off. Um, oh, cool. Um, that was good timing. I thought I was really, <laughs> I thought I had uh, a little bit, I was getting into the next chapter. Um, any comments? Now I hurried and I got to fill three minutes. <laughs> Um, let me see if there's a correlation between being mindful for three days and Jesus leaving the grave after three days. You think, uh, they think why not? Yeah, there's a lot of three days in the Bible, aren't there? In the grave, three days in the fish, three days blind. Um, yeah, very interesting. I, I think so. I, I think there's a, a lot of things that God plans out that only after the fact, yeah, only after the fact do we think, yeah, that's probably pretty good. Kenny? No, I agree with him. I think there is a correlation. Yeah. Especially when you mentioned John. Sounds like a big thing. Yeah. 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 Um, Yeah. That means it takes us three days to get our minds straight? Yeah. It's too late for me. <laughs> You're in the timeout mode. <laughs> I just, this is just so fascinating the way, I mean, I, and I, you know, I think God's right there with him, but 
Yeah, Terry? Uh, going back to the description of Paul, uh -huh. you know, he's a Paul and you only have one eyebrow. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I saw that. I've got it underlined, but I just did. I skipped past it. Since you bring it up, <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, I mean, Nicole, I think even said it too. He, he, yeah. Does he look like somebody who could take uh, any sort of authoritative position there? When he was at that point, all he had left was Roman citizenship, or they had just filleted him open, and he used it. And, it's, uh, there's an interesting discussion um, uh, in, about citizenship, uh, Terry 334, um, that why had, not, why had he not used that previously? You know, there were times that the Romans held him and he could have, and he took the beating, uh, so. I can't remember if it's in the book or had read it somewhere else that just, it, Dennis, keep in mind how very, very much Paul loved those Jewish people who were, I mean, he had said there in Romans, I would have been accursed from Christ on behalf of my Jewish brothers. I wanted so much. That's a that's a really tough attitude to repeat. Um, every soul that you encounter is a soul that's going to heaven or hell. And if we can do one thing to move that barometer upward, it's uh, and Paul just cared about people. Um, maybe that's why Jesus chose him. He knew how much he loved people. Had the question sitting right here beside me. Totally forgot. How do you do that? That humanity really creeps up on me every once in a while, doesn't it? <laughs>
Good morning. Good to see everyone out this morning. We've got some of our number off deer hunting this morning. I know my grandkids are over at their grandpa's and uh, great grandpa's in, in Kentucky hunting over, over there and some are around here too. So but good to have everyone here this morning. Uh, if you're a visitor, we ask you to fill out a visitor's card and put it in a collection plate when it comes around. That way we can have a record uh, of you coming by here and visiting with us. The uh, uh, bulletins were in the back. I hope everyone grabbed one of those. Uh, there's several things in there I won't be going over. Just some items here coming up. Uh, the Sunday morning uh, Sunday school is studying Acts, and we ordered uh, commentaries back earlier for everyone, and now there's a few more uh, that are wanting some of those commentaries. I'm going to be placing an order tomorrow, so if anybody wants a set of those commentaries, the church is buying them for the members here. So if you'd like a copy uh, that you didn't get earlier, be sure and let me know because I'll be ordering them tomorrow on that. We've got a few people that are wanting them, uh, so we'll, we'll send another order in. The uh, ladies' Bible study coming up on the 13th here at 6 p.m. They're going to be studying from Ephesians uh, on that. And then uh, some things coming up here. Uh, Teresa said that she and Mike are going to be headed to Florida here Tuesday. So uh, pray, pray for safe travel for them. They're going to be there till March. March, wintering in Florida. Man, uh, <laughs> it's tough, but somebody's got to do it, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and then Mamie's going to be following you probably 1st of December. Okay, so maybe you'll be down there with them right after they get down there and get things set up. So need to remember that and pray for their safe travels uh, on that. Uh, some updates on our sick. Susan's able to be out and about with us after her hip surgery. Good to see her with us today. And then uh, Cindy's going to be going for hip surgery tomorrow. Uh, the email went out uh, last day or two about uh, a food train preparing meals. So if you can do that, please get on that email and sign up uh, for the meals to help while Cindy's recovering from her uh, surgery. And then also uh, need to request prayers for the Orchard family. Uh, Rick's mom has been put on uh, hospice, so uh, please be praying for that family. Got some uh, information here. We always do this time of year, says we have once again adopted some students for Christmas this year. If you would like to choose a student to shop for, there's slips in the elder's office with sizes and gift ideas. Um, and if, if you'd rather just donate some money, just see Wendy or Ali Nepian on that. Uh, the items need to be purchased and brought to the church no later than December the 10th. And just attach uh, the tag uh, to the gifts so we'll know who, which child they're for on that. And if you need more information, Allie and Nepian uh, can do that. Linda, what's... Okay, Alice is sick with pink eye. Okay, and I requested prayers for that too. So those names for the uh, students... Uh, or in the elder's office if you'd like to grab one like we've done in the past. 
And also for the uh, items for the ch early childhood, I've got a card here from the Early Childhood Center thanking us for the clothes and the donations. Uh, says we have so many children in need that we can't thank you enough for your thoughtfulness and appreciate your willingness to give and help with our students' needs. And that's from the Early Childhood Center on that. As again, I'm glad everyone's here this morning, uh, ready to worship God, and Dennis is ready to lead us in that worship. Let's be standing, please. Jesus is well and alive today, makes his home in my heart. Blue skies and rainbows and sunbeams from heaven are what I can see. When my Lord is living in me, I know that Jesus is well and alive today. He makes his home in my heart. Nevermore will I be all alone since he promised me that we never would part. Green grass and flowers all blooming in springtime are works of the Master. I live for each day. I know that Jesus is well and alive today. He makes his home in my heart. Nevermore will I be all alone since he promised me that we never would part. Tall mountains, green valleys, the beauty that surrounds me all make me aware of the one who made it all. I know that Jesus is well and alive today. He makes his home in my heart. Nevermore will I be all alone since he promised me that we never would part. To uh, follow up the thoughts of that song, Jesus is well and alive because he lives I can face tomorrow. Cindy, it's going to be a tough day tomorrow, but uh, you get through it. I'm praying for you. God sent his son, they called him Jesus, he came to love, heal and forgive, he lived and died, to buy my pardon, an empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future. And life is worth the living just because he lives. How sweet to hold a newborn baby and feel the pride and joy he gives, but greater still, the calm assurance this child can face on certain days, because he lives, because he lives, I can face tomorrow, because he lives. All fear is gone, because I know he holds a future, and life is worth the living 
just because he lives. And then one day, I'll cross the river, I'll fight life's final war with pain. And then as death gives way to victory, I'll see the lights of glory, and I'll know he lives, because he lives, I can face tomorrow, because he lives, all fear is gone, because I know he holds the future, and life is worth the living just because he lives. Let's bow, please. Our Holy Father, just as we've been singing, we know you live. We know you are alive. We know that you are in control, and we are so very thankful for that. We're thankful, Father, that we have that promise that because you live, we can face tomorrow and each day. We thank you so much for sending your Son to die for us. And Father, we love you for that great sacrifice. We thank you that we have opportunities that we learn from your word. We thank you for opportunities you give us to speak to those who are outside your kingdom. And Father, we are so thankful this time of year for the beauty of creation. We're thankful that we can see that in various places and areas. And we know, Father, that you are in control again. We know that you are alive, that you give us these various things. And that you bless us each day. We're thankful that you know our name. And we're thankful, Father, for so many who have been ill who have received the help that they needed. They received comfort. They had healing. And we're thankful for that. And, Father, we're praying for those who have surgeries this week, for those who are having tests or whatever it may be related to their health. We just ask that you'll bless and be with them to bless them richly and help them with healing this week as well. Father, we thank you that we have this congregation to be able to meet here on the Lord's Day. And we thank you for the blessings that we receive from that. And we thank you, Father, for what we can learn from being here in class as well as in the lesson that Mitch will be bringing. We pray, Father, that you'll bless us this week, that we'll be safe. And we pray, Father, that you'll bless those who, are, who do not know you. There are so many, Father, who have turned from you, and yet there are even more who do not know you and recognize you. We would pray that there could be something done that would bring about an awakening in the mind of those individuals that they would start contemplating their future, that they would be thinking about eternity and realizing their situation if they're outside of you. Please give us strength to help those people to understand, to learn. Help us, Father, we pray that you'll put within each of us a desire to talk to those who are lost, who do not know you, and know that they need to make a change in their life. Please bless us today, Father, in our service. In Jesus' name, amen. So we move toward the Lord's Supper. This morning, let's sing this song. Like verse 3, give me a faithful heart, likeness uh, to thee. <clears throat> mm. 
Savior, thy dying love thou gavest me, nor should I aught withhold, dear Lord, from thee. In love my soul would bow, my heart fulfill its vow, some offering bring thee now, something for thee. Give me a faithful heart, likeness to thee. Let each departing day henceforth may see some work of love begun, some deed of kindness done, some wanderer sought and won, something for thee. All that I am and have, thy gifts so free, in joy, in grief, through life, dear Lord, for thee. And when thy face I see, my ransom soul will be through all eternity, something for In a few minutes, I'm going to be reading from the book of John, chapter 19, starting in the 16th verse. <coughs> and so he delivered him to them to be crucified. Then they took Jesus, bearing his own cross, to the place called place of the skulls, which is called Golgotha in Hebrew. There they crucified him and two others with him, and one on either side, and Jesus between. Pilate he wrote an inscription put on the cross, and it was written, "Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews." Therefore, many of the Jews read this inscription. For the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Roman, and Greek. So the high priest and the Jews were saying to Pilate, Do not write, King of the Jews, but that he says, I am the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I've written, I've written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garment and made four parts of each soldier except, except the tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven from top throughout. Then they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots to decide who it shall be, that the scriptures be fulfilled, which says, They divided my garments among themselves, 
and for my garments they cast lots. Indeed, this is what the soldiers did. Near the cross was standing the mother of Jesus and her sister, Mary, Mary of Cliffus, and Mary Magdalene. Then Jesus, seeing his mother and disciples he loved standing near, said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciples, Behold your mother. And from that hour they went to the disciples to his own, house, own home. After, the, after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were fulfilled, or finished, that the scriptures be fulfilled, says, I thirst. A vessel was, these filled with, with sour wine, and they put it on a sponge filled with sour, uh, sour wine on a high salt, uh, stalk, raised it to his mouth. Which he, which he, when he received the sour wine, Jesus said, "It is finished," and bowed his head and gave up the spirit. Can you imagine Satan watching all the proceedings that's going on? And imagine whenever Jesus says it's finished, Satan probably jumped with joy, said, "All this world is mine," not knowing that Jesus. And on the third day, was going to raise from the grave. And there again, it, everything would start his ministry all over again. Jesus, he left this memorial for us to remember him. Three or four times in the Bible, it says that Jesus told us to remember him. And that's what we're going to do as we gather around this table this morning. Let's go to a fallen word of prayer. Holy and righteous Father who art in heaven, we're so thankful, Lord, for the blessings that you give us. Thank you for your son Jesus as he hung upon that cross, Lord. We pray as we partake of this bread that represents his body upon that cross that, that we can go back and remember the things and the suffering that he did for us. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's pray again. Holy and righteous Father, again, we, we remember the suffering that, they, that you did for us. Thank you so much for the forgiveness of sin that you offered there that day. Thank you for the blood that was shed. We pray, Father, as we partake of this, this fruit of the vine that represents that, the emblem that represents that blood, that our minds will always be centered upon that cross. Remember what you did for each one of us. Be with us always, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. As we have concluded, Lord, Supper, it's always a convenient time to give back a portion of what God has given to us because the men are always, always ready and always up. <coughs> Again, if you're visiting with us, just fill out that uh, the card at the end of the pew. Put in a collection plate that's passed by. Our prayers are with you until you get to where you're going. And always feel free to always stop by and see us. We always pray that we can always make you feel welcome here. Let's go to the Father in a word of prayer again. Lord, we thank you so much for the many blessings that you give us. We know, Lord, there are so many things that you give us that, that we never do thank you for all of them. Lord, we appreciate the, the visitors as that come our way this, today. We pray that you'll be with them, Lord, as they, as they journey, uh, journey up on the roads of life. Continue to be with them till they get to where they're going safely. Lord, we pray now that we can give back a portion of what that's given to us just to further your work in your kingdom. We know that there's many souls, Lord, that, that needs to be saved. And we pray that we can be a part of that soul-saving uh, uh, ministry that, that we can use our money for. Lord, we be with us always now as we go and depart and go our separate ways as when the service is over. Be with us always, Lord. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen.
you would like to mark the invitation song, you're using a book. It's going to be 746-746. And uh, before the lesson... I always look through the uh, categories of songs in the back of the book. And I know Mitchell's lessons recently have been about the end times and Jesus' return. Um, kind of surprised me when I saw this song listed, but it is a really a, a beautiful song about how I am in this life and how I'm going home uh, to see my Father in heaven. So uh, it's a happy song. So we'll smile. I am a poor wayfaring stranger while traveling through this world of woe. Yet there's no sickness, toil, or danger in that bright world to which I go. I'm going there to see my father. I'm going there no more to roam. I'm only going over Jordan. I'm only going over home. I know dark clouds will gather round me. I know my way is rough and steep, but golden fields lie out before me, where God's redeemed shall ever sleep. I'm going there to see my father. I'm going there no more to roam. I'm only going over Jordan. I'm only going over home. I'll soon be free from every trial. My body sleep in the churchyard. I'll drop the cross of self-denial and enter on my great reward. I'm going there to see my father. I'm going there no more to roam. I'm only going over Jordan. I'm only going over home. Amen. Scripture reading for the lesson will be in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 through 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 through 7. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of mercies and the God of all comfort, whom comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble. With the comfort which which we ourselves are comforted by God, for as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. Now if we are afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effective for enduring the same sufferings which we also suffer. For if we are comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation, and our hope for you is steadfast because we know that you are partakers of the sufferings, so also you will partake of the consolation.
Good morning. <clears throat> Let's open up to the book of Revelation, chapter 1. This is where things get fun. I've, uh, I've been looking forward to this. I told you before, this is my favorite book, and I've always wanted to preach through it. I've done select lessons from it before, uh, but I've never preached through the book, and so I'm looking forward to doing this. I'm not going to say it's going to be easy. And I'm not going to say that I'm going to leave a lot of questions kind of hanging uh, as we go through this. But uh, it's going to be good, and I, I hope that you'll enjoy it just as much as I do uh, putting them together. Uh, but I'm going to approach this uh, differently than I would if I was, let's say, we're on a Wednesday night Bible class and we're studying Revelation. Uh, this, uh, this series is going to be different than that would be because my main focus in this lesson or in this series is going to be on application. Uh, how can we uh, apply the book, the principles that we read about in Revelation to our lives as Christians? Uh, and because of the nature of our study in the Sunday morning hour, uh, we're not going to be just simply talking about the different images, the different interpretations of the images and things like that. And so we'll leave a lot wanting in that area. But I hope that whenever we leave the, the lesson that we'll get a better understanding of why Revelation is here and what we can learn from it today in 2023 rather than just looking at it from a first century perspective. Uh, so let me say this from the very get-go. Uh, the book of Revelation leaves a lot of room for disagreement. There are a lot of different views that people have about this book. Some of those views can be flat out wrong, and other views not so much. Uh, I may hold a particular view about something in Revelation that you do not hold, and we may both be in constant agreement to disagree. And we may be in fellowship with God, and everything is great. Revelation, more than perhaps any other book in the Bible, leaves room for that kind of discussion. But I do want us to begin by thinking about something that I think a lot of people misunderstand about Revelation. I think it's an honest misunderstanding. I don't think people mean to misunderstand this idea, but I think it's just something that people naturally want to do because of the nature of the book. But I think if we can understand this from the very beginning, that it will make reading it and learning it and understanding it a little bit easier down the road. And it has to do with the way that we view the book and the way that we pronounce it. Maybe you've pronounced the book Revelations with an S on the end. That's not what this book is. This book is one revelation made up of many different images. Look at the first verse of the book. The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave to him to show his servants the things that must soon take place. We have one singular revelation made up of many different pictures, many different images. Think about it this way. Let's say Sarah and I are going to sit down and we are going to watch a movie. I don't say, Sarah, do you want to watch the movies? We're going to watch one movie, but that movie may have several different scenes. There may be a scene that takes place at the ocean. There may be a scene that takes place at the doctor office. There may be a scene in that movie that takes place in a courtroom. There can be several different scenes, but they all make up one movie. And that's Revelation. It's one revelation, and John is being given several, several different visions that make up that one revelation. I think if we can get that from the very get-go, it makes this book so much easier to handle, to deal with, and to understand. Because we are not talking about John seeing something now, and then a little bit later on he's going to see something else. And then a little bit later on well, he's going to be given another revelation. That's not the way that things work. I don't know how long it took for John to, be, to receive the revelation of all of these different things. But I do know this, that he was given everything that we this book in one particular setting, one particular revelation. And so I think if we can look at revelation that way, then it will be a little bit more manageable for us, which brings me to, well, what's the whole point of revelation to begin with? Well, the whole point is those who overcome get to come over. In other words, if these Christians will overcome the suffering that's coming their way, 
then they will get to come over to the other side of eternity and spend it with their Lord. And the same image is for us. The things that we deal with, while it may be the nature of those things that we deal with may be a little bit different than what the first century Christians were dealing with, but the, the application is the same. When I overcome whatever tribulation faces my life and I overcome it faithfully, then I get to come over and spend eternity with my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as well. That is the book of Revelation in one sentence. And I know when you read the book it doesn't seem that simple, but it really is. That's the main idea that we need to keep in mind. And so I want us to begin the lesson today by looking at two completely different ways, two different ways that we can approach life. Now, the ways that we approach life, it may be the way that we approach our spiritual life, it may be the way that we approach our physical life, but we can approach life with two different concepts. The first concept may be that we approach life with comfort. We're completely comfortable in everything that we do. I am comfortable being the minister at this congregation. I hope that you will have me for a while because I don't plan on going anywhere anytime soon. I'm very comfortable here. I love being here. Well, we may approach life that way too. Sometimes people approach life that way with so much comfort that they deal with things that they ought not to have to deal with. Sometimes people deal with relationships that they ought not have to deal with because they live their life in a comfortable mindset. That's one way that we can approach life. Another way that we can approach life is by being very impatient. Let's say we got the holidays coming up, and I would imagine if, if you're like me, I go to different places, and when you've got a bunch of people coming over to one particular house for a, for a gathering or a group, and it's cold outside, then most of the time we take our coats off, and there's probably a designated area in that house to place your coat. Maybe you go to a bedroom somewhere and you lay it on the bed, or maybe you lay it on a couch in the den somewhere. But because you're going to be there for a little bit, you take your coat off and you get comfortable and you lay that coat down. But let's say I'm going to somebody's house and let's just say I'm going to spend the night. Well, I know I'm going to be there for a while, but I walk in that house, I sit down, and 20, 30 minutes later after I got there, I've still got my shoes on, I've still got my coat on, I've still got my hat on. Nothing has changed about the attire that I'm wearing. And then somebody looks at me knowing that I'm going to be spending the night and they say in jest, why don't you take your shoes off and stay for a while? They know that I'm going to be there. There's no sense in me being fully dressed like that. Take off your jacket. Take off your shoes. But it's almost as if I'm sitting there waiting as if I'm going to get up and leave and go do something. Very impatient. Sometimes people will approach life that way too. I think this is why some people never obey the gospel. They know what they need to do. They understand what the Bible says. But maybe they're scared to death of commitment. And they don't want to give their, their lives over to a particular lifestyle or a particular way that they are to do things. And so because of their impatience and because of their wanting to continue to go through life with their own thinking or their own way, they never commit to anything. Those are two very different ways, but two very common ways that people in our world today approach life, whether it be physical life or spiritual life. But when we read Revelation, we understand what John is trying to get these Christians to do. He's trying to get them to face the future with faithfulness and urgency. As we live our lives as God's people, regardless of what the day brings, I need to make up my mind now that I face whatever my life brings me with faithfulness and urgency because I'm a Christian and Jesus is my Lord. And that challenges me to live with a completely different mindset, with a completely different attitude in everything that I do in life. John wants these Christians to understand this in the very first chapter. Before he ever starts talking about the suffering, before he ever starts talking about the things that they're doing well and the things that they're not doing so well, we'll talk about that next week in chapters 2 and 3. Before he talks about anything else, you need to be urgent in your life. 
And you need to decide to be faithful now, whatever the situation brings. And that's what chapter 1 is basically about. But there are a lot of things that John says, a lot of revelation we may say that he is given to communicate those different things. And so let's look at some of these things. I want us to begin first by looking at two lessons that I think we can gain from this very first chapter. And then after that, we're going to get into what everybody wants to talk about, and that's the vision of the Son of Man and what all of that means. But let's kind of lay the groundwork on what we can learn from this first about our own urgency and our own relevancy in life as God's people. Here's the first thing. We need to strive for relevancy. If I'm going to handle Revelation correctly, I need to remember that it's an inspired document. Let's never forget that this is inspired by God. And what that means is it's going to be relevant for every single person that reads it, regardless of when they live. This book is relevant for the Christians in the first century who are being threatened physically for their faith. And it's relevant for you and me today who can worship in the comfort of a church building without any problems from the outside forces at all. It's relevant for both of us. And so we need to strive to see what that relevancy is and apply it to our own lives. John does this in so many different ways. But let's just look at a couple of verses in this chapter. Verse, verse 1, The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John. This, these things were made known to John. That's the way the ESV says it. Some translations may say something different, but the word that's used here is the word for sign. John's favorite word for miracle is sign. He doesn't use miracle or wonder or something like that very often. John prefers the word sign. For example, in John's gospel, John has seven signs that he communicates it's in that gospel. The water to wine is the first one. The second one is the healing of the Roman official's son in chapter 4. You've got the healing of the lame man who had been lame for 38 years. He was healed by Jesus in John chapter 5. Seven times John gives these signs. Now why does he mention signs? Because John doesn't just want to call attention to the fact that this is a power or a wonder that Jesus performed that was miraculous. This is a miraculous power or wonder that Jesus performed because it points to something about Him that people need to understand. And case in point in the Gospel of John, the very opening verse says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So what do these seven signs communicate? What's John's whole point in the Gospel of John? Jesus is God. He's not just a man. He's God. But these miracles are signs that communicate that idea. They're things that people can see. It's not just words on a page. John could preach till he's blue in the face. Jesus is God. But he's got these pictures. He's got these images that go with that. And in Revelation, it's very much the same thing. Because this revelation was signified, we may say, to John. When he's writing these things, he gives these Christians something that they can look at, a visual image that goes along with the relevancy of his message. Have you ever read a, a book? A lot of times it's a children's book, and you open up that book, and poof, this image pops up, and you've got this little paragraph about whatever you're seeing, but it's an image. It's a, it's a pop-up book. That's Revelation in a nutshell. We may not be able to see the physical image, but that's exactly what John is doing. I love what Ray Summers says. Ray Summers calls the book of Revelation a divine picture book, and that's exactly what it is. If we can get this image in our mind, we have more than just words. We have something that is connected to these words that communicates a visual image that goes along with it. But it's very relevant because of the way that John does it. I want you to see what's going to happen. We look on to verse 9 and we see something else. 
I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. John is their partner in the tribulation. He uh, has a relationship to this, these problems that the Christians are facing. He's on the island of Patmos on account of the word of God, he says. Patmos was a prison. That's basically what the island of Patmos was. It was a prison. And it may be that what John is saying is that John went to Patmos to preach the gospel. And that's why he's there. John was the first one to engage in prison ministry as we know it. I don't think that's what's going on here at all. I think what's going on here is John is a prisoner on the island of Patmos because he was preaching the gospel and got himself exiled by some Roman official. Why does that have relevancy for the audience here? And why is it relevant for us? Well, think about these Christians that are being called to go through certain things that they really don't want to go through. I don't know about you, but sometimes I'm guilty of thinking, man, I wish I would have been an apostle. Somebody that could write an inspired document. Somebody that could perform miracles. Somebody that could go to a particular place, lay hands on another person, and distribute miraculous gifts to those people. How cool would that have been? And I can think about that difference between myself and an apostle in the first century and think, they were so much better than me. But that's not true, is it? Tribulation is something that every one of God's people goes through. It doesn't matter if I'm an apostle or not. Every one of us goes through those things. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 7, Paul said, When you suffer, I suffer. When you are comforted, I am comforted. I may be an apostle, but that doesn't matter. We are in this together. In Philippians chapter 3 and verse 10, Paul takes it up a notch. Paul said that he was willing to just put off all of these different things for the sake of the gospel. He was willing to forget about his life in Judaism as great and as padded as his stats were as a Jew. Forget about all of that. Paul may have even forgot about a lot of the inheritance that he would have gained from his family. But why did he do it? In verse 10 he said, so that I could share in the sufferings of Jesus Christ. Tribulation and suffering is so ingrained and entrenched in what God's people actually are as our very Savior Himself went through those things for our, on our behalf. And so when John writes these things to a group of Christians who are going to be persecuted physically for their faith, he is writing as a Christian who is physically persecuted for his faith. He has to remain faithful just like the church does. Them or us. And so it's very relevant, this message is, for all people because of the tribulation that's involved. We look at verse 11 and it says, uh, Write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamum, and to Thyatira, and to Sardis, and to Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Whenever we look on a map, by the way, we're going to see these seven churches basically in a circle. And so they're living in the same general area. They're connected to each other. They know about each other's situation. They're all dealing with a lot of the same things. They're individual congregations. And so their individual congregation may be struggling with things that others were not. But they're still expected to rely on each other, to understand each other, and the situations that are involved. It's very much like us, I think. We invite other congregations to our gospel meeting. Other congregations invite us to their gospel meeting because we all need the same thing. Regardless of what we are going through individually as a congregation, a congregation 10 miles down the road may be struggling to appoint elders, while another congregation has five or six of them, and whenever they need more, they just pull one from the list or a couple from the list of people waiting in line to be an elder. Everybody's situation is different as far as the individual congregation is concerned, but at the end of the day, 
congregations that live in south, southeast Missouri are going to be dealing with some of the same things. It wasn't very much different for these seven churches, uh, seven churches in Asia. And so John is really striving to communicate this lesson, to communicate this message in a way that all of these Christians can be able to look at it, interact with it, and find not just stability with their own relationships and their own congregations respectively, but for all of them to have that same kind of relationship. Here's another lesson that we learned from this. That we need to give urgent attention to what's relevant today. Revelation chapter 1, look at verse 1 again. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave Him to show to His servants the things that must soon take place. Some translations will say, must shortly come to pass. The word that's used here for soon is basically communicating two points of time. You've got two points of time, but the emphasis is on the relatively short amount of time that takes place between those two intervals, between those two points in time. And so this, these things are not going to happen years and years and years down the road. These things are going to happen in a short enough amount of time where the Christians that John's writing to needs to be ready for it now and prepared for it now. Not wait before you get prepared for it, but prepare for it now because it's going to take place in a short amount of time. You look at verse 3 and it says it again, for the time is near or is at hand. You may remember uh, uh, Matthew chapter 3 with both Jesus's and John's ministry. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is what? Is at hand. Hand, same idea here. It's now. It's coming. Do something about it now. That's what John's audience needs to do. You look at verse 3, and it says, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it. Why read it aloud? Because books in the first century are very, very, very expensive. Not a whole lot of people that have books in the first century. Go to a library somewhere to hear it read. Or if you want to hear the Old Testament read, go to a synagogue where the copy of the Hebrew Bible is going to be waiting to be read. Not everybody has a copy of Scripture. And so it needs to be read, read aloud. In Colossians chapter 4, Paul told the Colossians, hey, when you get done reading this letter... Send it to the Laodiceans and have them read it too. And by the way, the one that I wrote to Laodicea, get it and read it to you as well. Exchange these things. But you have to read these things aloud because not everybody can read and not everybody has a copy because they're very expensive. But you don't just read it aloud, you hear it and keep it. Now that sounds kind of redundant, doesn't it? Well, why are you hearing it and then keeping it? Well... Because when you hear something, in the Jewish mind, hearing implies obedience. In Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4, Moses said, Hear, O Israel, <clears throat> the Lord our God, the Lord is one. In other words, when they heard that, they would not just say, I need to listen to this or I need to hear it, but I need to do it too. Automatically, hearing and obedience are intertwined in the Jewish mind. And so once they hear and obey it, now they've got to keep it. They've got to keep it in mind and they've got to keep it in their feet and in their legs because everything that they do is going to be wrapped up in this message that they are being called to not just hear and believe, but to interact with in their lives. So... You've got them and you got a need to not just hear what's relevant, but to give urgent attention to what's relevant in their specific day at that point in time because things are about to come soon. And by the way, in Revelation 22, notice some of the last words that Jesus says in this book. And behold, 
I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. The beginning of this book is tied into what we hear and what we keep and the relatively short amount of time that these things are going to take place. The very end of the book communicates the exact same thing. And so the book begins and it ends with these same thoughts. This same urgent, relevant thought. Well, let's move on to the vision itself. And go back to chapter 1 because that's where we're going to be. What makes this vision of the Son of Man urgent and relevant here in this particular part of the book? Well, first of all, you've got His transcendence over time. In verse 8, it says, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Alpha and Omega, basically the first and last words of the Greek alphabet. The beginning and the end. I'm not held by time. I transcend time. I'm alive now and I'm going to be alive forevermore. Number two, transcendence over death. What does he say in verse 17 or verse 18? He says that he's the living one. He died and behold he is alive forevermore and I have the keys of death and Hades. What do we have when we have the keys to something? Can you get in my house unless I give you the key to my house? I hope not. If you can, by the way, let me know because that's a problem. I need to fix it. But keys allow you to have access to a particular thing. But there's a lot more than that being communicated here. If I give you the keys to my car, you're not only able to open the door to my car, you're able to sit in the driver's seat, put the key in the ignition, Put it in drive and take off. It gives you full control of that car if I give you the keys. Basically what Jesus is saying here is I have control over death and the realm of the dead, Hades itself. And he has those keys because he's the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He transcends time, but because he's conquered that death for us on our behalf. So he has transcendence over time, but he also has care for his church. In verses 12 and 13, he says, Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And on turning, I saw the seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man. In verse 16, it says, In his right hand, he held seven stars. What does that mean? You're going to come to appreciate it when John tells you what something means. And in verse 20, he tells us exactly what these seven golden lampstands or candlesticks and seven stars are. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Where is Jesus standing? In the midst of the lampstands. In the midst of His church. He stands as the guardian, as the protector, as the Messiah who cares for His church. He's holding the angels of those churches in His right hand. Now what those angels are, I don't know. It may be that because angel just simply means messenger that these seven churches were communicating with one another. And there were different messengers from these churches going around making sure, checking on each other to make sure that everything was good and they were kind of taking care of one another. I don't think so. Because in the Old Testament we've got people like Michael, Gabriel, these angels that do God's bidding on behalf of His people. So I think that's what we have going on here. I don't know for sure. But we do know this, it all comes back to God, to Jesus, to our Savior, caring for His church. And so why is this vision of the Son of Man relevant? Why give that? Because it communicates all of these things. And it gives our minds and the, and the, the Christians' minds in the first century that are going to be dealing with these problems, it gives them a little bit more comfort and ease of mind and stability as they move forward facing the problems that they're going to be facing. And so you've got the relevant vision. It's an urgent, it's a relevant vision. 
I want to say something here. I'm out of time, but let me say something very quickly before we look at these things. If I try to understand the book of Revelation without studying the Old Testament, my interpretation is going to be wrong. The Old Testament is referenced over 400 times in this book. If I'm going to understand it, I've got to use the Old Testament. And that being said, this vision of the Son of Man is taken directly from the Old Testament in Daniel chapter 7 and Daniel chapter 10. And when you read those two chapters, you'll see the, the significance and the connections immediately. You won't have to look for them. They'll be there immediately. And so, what about it then? Well, Jesus is our great high priest, according to verse 13. In the midst of the lamp stands one like a son of man clothed with a long robe and a golden sash around his chest. The angel in, in Daniel chapter 10 is dressed the same way. And in Exodus chapter 28, the high priest wore these same things. And so what's being connected is that Jesus is the great high priest. But he doesn't just perform the priestly duties on our behalf. He is the priestly duties. He was the sacrificial lamb that was slain. He didn't put a lamb on the altar. He put himself on the altar, figuratively speaking. He is our great high priest. In the very next verse... The hairs of his head were white like wool, like snow. His wisdom is being communicated. In Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 31, Solomon said that uh, the gray hair is a crown of glory and it is one in a righteous life. Sometimes we look at gray hair and think it's a bad thing. But gray hair actually shows that I've got a lot of wisdom that I've been there, I've done that, I've learned a lot throughout my life. How much different would 1 Kings chapter 12 look if, if Rehoboam would have listened to the wise men instead of listening to the younger men? The kingdom would have never split. Now God had plans and everything worked out for His glory and for His purposes, but none of those things would have ever happened if He would have just listened to these people with gray hair. Perfect... Uh, vision. His eyes were like a flame of fire. He sees our situation and everybody's situation perfectly. You remember Mark chapter 4 when these disciples are in a boat and there's this big storm tossing this boat all around? Jesus is sleeping in the bottom of the boat. I mean, why would he do that? So they run up to him and they say, Master, Master, do you not care that we are perishing? Jesus doesn't really rebuke them. Instead, he thinks, man, why are you guys such little faith? Stands up, rebukes the wind and the sea. In other words, he basically tells them, look, don't fret. Everything's going to be okay. I know every situation and I know it perfectly. He sees everything the way that it needs to be seen. He knows this situation that these seven churches are going to be dealing with better than they know it themselves. In verse 15, his feet were like burnished bronze, refined furnace, and then his voice was like the roar of many waters communicating his authority. In Ezekiel chapter 43 and verse 2, God's voice is like the sound of many waters you ever picked up a seashell on the beach and listened to it? You can hear the beach and it sounds like a roar, doesn't it? In no way is that the same thing as this is, but it kind of gives us something to think about when we think about these roar of many waters. Everything in this vision and everything in this chapter is preparing, God's preparing John and by communication and by association with God in the revelation that he has been given, John is preparing these Christians for the things that they are going to face. Because it's easy a lot of times as God's people for us to forget just how much Jesus cares. And just how much he is there. And just how much protection he offers to us. Sometimes it's hard for me to, to, to admit that I forget just how powerful my Savior is. But I can think that way from time to time. 
One thing that I love about the book of Revelation is it reminds me how powerful my Savior is and how much He cares about my situation. As irrelevant as I may think it seems to Him, as small as it is compared to the sufferings that He endured, He still cares just as much about me and my situation as He did His situation in His own day when He went to the cross to die for the sins of the world. And so if you are here this morning and you need a little bit of hope, a little bit of faith, a little bit of stability as you face your Christian life, Jesus is the answer. He was the answer 15 years ago. He's still the answer today and He will be the answer for all eternity into the future. If you need Him this morning, don't wait. It may be that you need Him as your Savior. It may be that you need to wash your sins away in baptism and allow God to add you to His church so the protection that Jesus offers can be applied to you too. If that's what you need this morning, don't wait another second. Do it now. If you need us to pray for you, to help you in any way as a Christian, ask for those prayers this morning as well as we stand and sing. What a song of praise will be outpoured when he comes in glory by and by. How sweet, how sweet when he comes in the sky. What joy, what joy when he comes in glory by and by. We will have our robes all white as snow when he comes in glory by and by. Oh, be ready with the Lord to go when he comes in glory by and by. How sweet, how sweet when he comes in the sky. What joy! joy when he comes in glory by and by i am longing for that happy day when he comes in glory by and by for with him i hope to soar away when he comes in glory by and by how sweet how sweet when he comes in the sky. What joy, what joy when he comes in glory by and by. Amen. Thank you, Mitchell. Sing the first two verses, uh, Jeff, and then we'll be uh, dismissed in prayer. Steve will lead us, and then go out and enjoy what looks like a beautiful, beautiful day. And we'll be thinking about you uh, tomorrow. Uh, Susan, is Susan still here? Yes. Okay. Susan, call Cindy next week and tell her how easy a hip replacement surgery is. I think I want to talk to me. Oh, Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good to see you uh, good to see her back and Cindy would get through it alright here we go Jesus 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 in the morning Jesus at the noon time Jesus 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 when the sun goes down Love him, love him, love him in the morning, love him at the noontime. Love him, love him, love him when the sun goes down. Please bow your head with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you 
Thank you for the many blessings you've given us today, given you, given us a beautiful day to come together and worship your word and to learn and to sing praises to you and to your glory. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who you sent to this earth to teach us and to provide us salvation from in this world and in the next. We ask you to go with us today as we leave this place of worship. Go with us and protect us, bless us, and bring us back at the next appointed time. We ask all these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.